Hello ladies and gents, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and in this video we're going to start talking about Kotlin coroutines. Now, coroutines, virtual threads, green threads, fibers, and everything in between are all the rage, but they all talk about the same concept. And in this video I'm going to discuss about this concept as it applies in Kotlin. So this video will assume that you know some basic Kotlin and some basic ideas of how threads work, and I'm going to discuss about coroutines, how they work, how they're scheduled, and how you can make them run. As always, I recommend that you write code with me in this video, and whenever you need to refresh your memory about these concepts, just refer back to the video or to the written form at the blog with the link in the description. All right, so that being said, I have here in my IntelliJ project a plain Kotlin file with just a Hello World application. I'm going to start talking about coroutines. Now, in order to run coroutines, you need a library that comes almost pre-built, but you will need to import it. So here I have a Maven project in IntelliJ, and my Palm XML contains the library definitions. Don't worry, I'm going to share this Palm XML in the article. So the important library is... Um, coroutines, so Kotlin X coroutines, I'm using 164 at the moment of this recording, and I'm also going to use SLF4J so that we can log some stuff, including the thread ID, or rather the Kotlin coroutine ID, so that we can see how our code is being executed. So the versions that you will need are, of course, Kotlin and Kotlin X coroutines. This is the one that we need. All right, now, getting back to our source file, I'm going to start talking about coroutines themselves. Now, What's on earth is a coroutine. I want you to start thinking of a coroutine as a thread, but I'm putting this thread in quotes because it's not exactly a thread in the classical sense. In the classical sense, a thread is this giant data structure that is managed by the JVM and the operating system to run our processes on our computer. For example, this text editor and the other processes on the operating system, the screen recorder that I'm using right now, and so on and so forth. But these threads are heavy-handed data structures that contain a lot of context, and uh, scheduling and descheduling happens with a significant performance degradation by the operating system, which is why the operating system needs to manage a small number of these threads. So spawning threads, killing them, suspending, resuming threads is a performance-heavy computation, which is why we have this lightweight threads. These are called user space threads, or green threads, or lightweight threads, or coroutines, or virtual threads in the JDK19, but they're all the same concept which is to say that a coroutine or a lightweight thread is a block of code that is executed seemingly independently from other blocks of code. So these coroutines can be thought of as threads on top of operating system threads. So Kotlin has this coroutine mechanism built in so that we can run heavy parallel and concurrent applications. So this is why we need these coroutines, because in the age of multi-core processing and so many requests per second and parallelization and so on and so forth, we need a nicer way to manage this heavy parallelism. And we are managing this parallelism with coroutines in Kotlin, with fibers in the case of Scala, with uh, virtual threads on the JDK, on recent JDKs, and uh, similar concepts in other languages or frameworks. So in Kotlin, we're going to explore this concept as it applies in Kotlin, which bears the name of coroutines. Now, a coroutine is run via a function with the suspend keyword. So I'm going to define a function called suspend fun, and I'm going to call this bath time. I'm going to simulate a morning routine. For example, I want to take a bath, I want to boil some water, I want to uh, make some coffee, and I want to eat my favorite breakfast, let's say. So I'm going to create my first suspend function, so bath time, and I'm going to log something to the console, which is why I'm going to define a val, I'm going to call this logger which is of type um, logger with a capital L. So logger, I'm going to import that from SLF4J and I'm going to use logger factory dot get logger with, let's say, uh, coroutines playground. Okay, so this logger will be used to log some stuff to the console. I'm going to say logger info and I'm going to use, let's say, going to the bathroom and I'm going to use a special function called delay. And delay needs to be imported. So I'm going to import everything from coroutines. I'm going to say kotlinx.coroutines, and I'm going to import everything in there. So I have access to the delay function. And delay takes an argument with uh, 500L. So this is my duration that I'm going to suspend this 
coroutine for. And uh, then I'm going to say logger info. I'm going to say uh, bath done, exiting. Okay. Now, this function has the keyword suspend in front of it, which means that if I try to run it in main, it won't work. So I'm going to say bath time. And the compiler says that the suspend function should only be called from a coroutine or another suspend function. Now, technically, the suspend keyword transforms a function into something that's non-blocking, therefore running on another thread. So I'm going to decorate this main function with a suspend keyword as well, which means that my application can now run. Now, before I run this application, I'm going to go to the run menu here in IntelliJ, and I'm going to edit configurations. And here under coroutines kt, so my coroutines file, here under VM options, I'm going to add a... Um, uh, flag here. So I'm going to say dash d caught linux dot coroutines dot debug to add the coroutine ID so that we can see it in the console. So I'm going to apply and then OK. And then I'm going to run my coroutines application. And we're going to see some tags here that uh, designate the thread ID for that particular function. So here I'm going to say going to the bathroom and then bath done exiting. Notice that these two lines are tagged with a different thread ID. So going to the bathroom is executed from the main thread. So this is why we see main here. And the bath done exiting is being executed from the default executor. So this is another thread ID. That's because of this delay thing, which suspends or quote unquote blocks the computation. But it doesn't block in a classical sense that it hogs the thread on which this function is running, but rather it frees up the thread to do something else, and then the rest of the function is being executed on some other thread. Now this blocking business, and uh, in Scala terms that's called semantic blocking, I think that's a pretty fitting term, this semantic blocking needs a bit of magic to work so transparently to us as programmers. In reality, the Kotlin runtime will need to have what is called a coroutines context or called continuation. So continuation. And this continuation is a data structure that stores all local context. That is all local variables, the point at which the function was broken down and the function can be broken down multiple times, not just once and so on and so forth. So this continuation data structure is being saved by the Kotlin coroutines runtime and this continuation data structure is resumed. So continuation restored here right after the semantic blocking. So the continuation here will uh, restore all the local variables and so on and so forth so that the rest of this code can run smoothly and continue, that's why it's called a continuation, on the other thread that the runtime has scheduled it on. So this is just so that you can appreciate the kind of complexity that happens behind the scenes. Now, because I have more space and time in an article, I'm also going to add a little blob of code in the blog post so that you can get a sense of how this is being destructured by the Kotlin compiler. All right. Now I'm going to press forward with structured concurrency. All right. Now I'm going to add to my little morning routine another function. I'm going to add a suspend fun. I'm going to call this boiling water, which is a prerequisite for, for example, making coffee or boiling in a hard boiled egg or something like that. All right. So I'm going to say boiling water and I'm going to do pretty much the same thing. I'm going to say logger info and I'm going to use, let's say, boiling water. Then I'm going to delay, for example, a second, like a hundred milliseconds. And I'm going to say logger info. I'm going to say water boiled. Okay. Now, if I want to combine these two, I'm going to call another suspend fun. I'm going to say sequential morning routine. Now, in order to run two suspend function in sequence, we will have to run a coroutine scope. So I'm going to say coroutine scope. And inside this coroutine scope, this is a construct here. Inside this coroutine scope, I'm going to to call the bath time. And then in another coroutine scope, I'm going to use the boiling water thing. The coroutine scope is a wrapper over a suspend function, which will start a context for coroutines. And that means that the coroutines, or rather the suspend functions that you can place inside this scope, so you can add more code here, including suspend functions, 
That means that everything that happens inside this coroutine scope is isolated from everything that happens in other coroutine scopes. That means that before this function can finish, this coroutine scope, because the coroutine scope is nothing more but a function, really, um, in order to stop or rather finish this coroutine scope, all the coroutines inside this block will have to finish. So you can pretty much put parallel code here and all needs to finish before the scope is closed. So essentially what we're doing here is a batch of parallel code that all needs to finish before the next batch of parallel code starts. This is why I've placed these two functions in two different coroutine scopes. Now, if I run my sequential morning routine in main, let's see what happens. All right, warm up the compiler. So we have going to the bathroom, bath done exiting. So notice that the first coroutine has finished before the boiling water starts. Now this coroutine scope structure is much more powerful than this because it uh, allows sharing context between coroutines, it allows support for cancellation, it has this parenting feature uh, in the sense that all the coroutines launched inside are child coroutines of this coroutine scope and so on and so forth. As we progress through this tutorial and in subsequent parts, we are going to also explore some of those features. Now, inside a coroutine scope, all the suspend functions are executed in sequence, which means that if I put bath time before boiling water, and I comment this first one out, we're going to see a very similar result. So bath time and boiling water will execute one before the other. So notice that we have a very similar output, but you can start them at the same time. So I'm going to run another suspend function. I'm going to call this concurrent morning, morning routine. And I'm going to add a single coroutine scope and inside I'm going to have my bath time and my boiling water, but I'm going to wrap them in another construct. It's essentially just a function. I'm going to use launch here. So launch will essentially start a new coroutine. So I'm going to say launch for bath time and launch for boiling water as well. Launch will essentially start a new coroutine that will execute in parallel. So it's analogous in concept with a new thread. So you would say new thread and you would pass in some sort of runnable or lambda if you're using Scala and so on and so forth. So it's as if you're saying new thread dot start and that means that the code bath time and boiling water will start running concurrently inside this coroutine scope. This is what the launch structure means. So if I call this thing in main, I'm going to see the boiling water and bath time executing at the same time. So boiling water and going to the bathroom are happening at the same time. Now, as I just mentioned, all the coroutines that are inside a coroutine scope are children of this coroutine scope. So this coroutine is a child of the coroutine scope. And inside a coroutine scope, you can nest other coroutine scopes and so on and so forth. We are going to talk about uh, coroutine scopes and child relationships in subsequent parts. Now, if you don't want this parent-child relationships and you just want to launch a coroutine without any sort of parent need, you can use the global scope. So I'm going to use suspend fun. I'm going to say no struct concurrency morning routine. So I'm going to use a um, global scope launch. So I'm going to say global scope dot launch. And I can use my bath time here. And I'm also going to use another global scope launch. And I'm going to use my boiling water. This pretty much does the same thing. Now, global scope itself is a little bit trickier because error handling is not trivial at all. So use this with care. I just wanted to show you what you can do with coroutines that don't really need to have a parent, right? So no struct currency morning routine. If I call this in main, we're going to see the exact same parallelism happening, but the global scope has its own set of problems that you need to take care of. Now, because the main thread exits before the bath time and boiling water have any time to finish, I will also use a thread sleep the plain old Java thread sleep, and I will going to use uh, 2000 or something like that to block the main thread and uh, wait for these uh, coroutines to finish. So notice that we have going to the bathroom and boiling water happening at the same time. All right. 
Cool. The next thing that I wanted to show you is how you can plan coroutines. So for example, in my morning routine, I would like to do the following. I would like to um, go to the bathroom and take a bath. So take a bath. And I would also like to start the boiling water. But then after both of these are done, so after both are done, and uh, these two can happen at the same time because the boiling water doesn't really need my supervision, uh, with some safety precautions, of course. Uh, after both of these are done, I'm going to, let's say, eat my breakfast. This flow can be done in a bunch of ways. Let's um, create another suspend fund with eat my breakfast, let's say. So I'm going to have another suspend fund, eat my breakfast. And I'm going to pretty much do the same thing. I'm going to logger and wait for a bit, let's say 500 milliseconds, and uh, say uh, starting to eat. And let's say done eating. Actually, because I'm boiling water, let me just call this um, make coffee. All right, so instead of eating breakfast, I'm gonna say make coffee. And I'm gonna say starting to make coffee. And I'm going to say done with coffee. Good. So um, drink my coffee. Okay. So I have three suspend funds. Now I would like to create this little flow where the first two things are happening at the same time. And after both are done, I want to drink my coffee. I'm going to create another suspend fund. I'm going to call this morning routine with coffee. And I'm going to start a coroutine scope. And inside this coroutine scope, I'm going to launch the bath time and boiling water. So I'm going to say launch with bath time and launch with boiling water. Now, the fun thing about this launch thing is that the function launch also returns a value. I'm going to say val, let's call this bath time job. And this is a job which you can control so this job is a handle of the coroutine so you can control how the coroutine is executed i'm going to also create another valve i'm going to say boiling water job job and this is a job okay now with these two i can launch them so now they're happening at the same time and i can start to join them so i'm going to say bath time job join and then boiling water job dot join and the join method is a semantic blocking until the coroutine is done. So essentially I'm starting these tasks at the same time. So they're running in parallel and then I'm going to block until both are done. Good. Now after that, I'm going to launch another one. So I'm gonna say launch with this prepare coffee or make coffee thing. So make coffee. So starting two coroutines, waiting for them to finish and then start a third coroutine. So this is one way to do it. I'm going to use that in main. So let's start my morning routine here in main. You can also ins insert meditation, workout, or whatever you fancy. So we have boiling water and going to the bathroom at the same time. Bath done, exiting, and water boiled. So uh, the two things happen at the same time. And then we're starting to make coffee and then done with coffee after half a second. Good. So this is one way to do it with a coroutine scope and managing the jobs ourselves. Or we can add nested coroutine jobs so we can have let's say suspended fun i'm gonna say uh, morning coroutine with coffee structured and i can have a coroutine scope and inside this coroutine scope i can start another coroutine scope so coroutine scope coroutine coroutine scope and here inside this other coroutine scope i can add my parallel jobs and I can say launch bath time and launch with boiling water. And I don't need to uh, get a handle of these jobs because the coroutine scope will only end when both of these are done. So after the coroutine scope, we know that both uh, jobs or both coroutines are done. And then I can launch my other one, make coffee. All right, so these two happen at the same time in a nested coroutine scope and the make coffee will happen after that. This is why we have the so-called structured concurrency because we can control where and how coroutines are executed and in what order. 
And notice how clean the code looks and um, all the internal magic, all the thread scheduling, all the data structures for suspension and resuming and so on and so forth happen behind the scenes and you don't have to do absolutely anything about that. One last thing that I wanted to show you is how to return values from coroutines. Right now, our uh, coroutine functions, so these suspend functions, just return void, but we can return meaningful values like strings or ints or other data structures. Let's say that my brewing coffee or making coffee thing returns a string, let's say. So I'm going to say suspend fun, let's say preparing Java coffee. And this returns a string, let's say. So I'm uh, specifically returning a string, and I'm going to use pretty much the same logic, starting to make coffee, done with coffee, and then at the end I'm going to say return, let's say Java coffee. Let me add another one. Let's say suspend fun uh, with toasting bread. This is a morning routine after all. And uh, this returns, let's say, another string. And uh, I'm going to use pretty much the same logic. I'm going to delay for a thousand milliseconds, starting to make uh, breakfast. And then I'm going to say toast is out. And then I'm going to return toasted bread. So I have two suspend functions, and uh, this time they return a string. Now, uh, I'm also going to compose these two together, and uh, let's say we have Java coffee and toasted bread, and I would like to combine them in one uh, statement of my breakfast, and I'm going to say suspend fun, I'm going to say uh, prepare breakfast. And I'm going to use a coroutine scope, so coroutine scope, and I'm going to launch uh, these Java coffee and toasting bread functions, but I'm going to use the async structure. So I'm going to say async, and in async I'm going to use uh, prepare Java coffee, and I'm going to also use async with toasting bread. And the difference between launch and async is that this async business returns what is called a deferred. So I'm going to say val coffee is equal to async preparing Java coffee and another, I'm going to use another variable, let's say toast, as async toasting bread. Now these variables are called deferred. So deferred is a data structure that will be filled in in the future when this function inside the async has been completed. So this is analogous to um, the future data type so future t uh, in Java and in Scala. So these deferred data structures will be available at some point. Now, we're using the async construct because this deferred thing can be processed by callbacks. Either that, or you can wait for them to finish. So you can say semantic blocking with, uh, let's say, final coffee as coffee, coffee.await. And similarly, you can say toast or final toast as toast.await. Again, the await thing is only semantic blocking because it happens in a coroutine scope. And finally, you can say logger info. Um, let's say I'm eating uh, final toast, final toast, and drinking final coffee or something like that. And here in my prepare breakfast, I'm going to uh, call that in main. And if we start that, we're going to see that toasting bread and making coffee happen pretty much at the same time. So starting to make breakfast, starting to make coffee at the same time, done with coffee, toast is out. And when both of these are done, then I'm printing this eating toasted bread and drinking Java coffee. So there you have it, folks, the essentials of coroutines in Kotlin. Now, Kotlin is a recent addition to the Rock the JVM channel, so let me know what you think. And if you like it, I'm going to make more of Kotlin. And uh, until next time, folks, I'm Daniel, signing off.